this is a, a project I've been doing for years and years and years now. It is a flower hook. It's done out of half inch square material. It uses four tools to make it. And I've been making these for years. My wife has a trivet collection that I have been, and every trivet needs a different style of hook to hold it up on the wall. But the she wanted something consistent, so I keep making the same flower. Uh, and it's evolved over time. Some of my earlier ones look different than the ones that I do now. Oh, how clear this is. I do have a storyboard starting from half inch square to a double-sided taper to a squish to a lozenge of some sorts, and then chisel marks, round punch marks, adapted round punch marks, and to the final hook. And something that came up on this project that also works as well is that it also is very easy to do a paw type of shape and you end up with a leash hook. And honestly, I think I may have made more dog paw shaped hooks for leashes than I have made flowers because I know a lot of people with dogs. So without further ado, I will get started. This is the hook that we end up working with that I just showed everybody. Um, it's a little rough picture there from the forge. And like I said, I start with half inch stock. Uh, oh, like I said, I only use four tools. They are a, a chisel, what I call a hollow punch, which leaves a domed shape. Um, I made this tool with a flat punch by drilling a small depression in the top and grinding the edges so that it uh, the edges are equal and come right up to the edge of the hole. And then two punches, round nose punches, a smaller one that is very long and a shorter one that is a little bit fatter. And the first step is doing this two-sided taper on half inch square stock. Uh, this will be relatively quick. I only realized how chewed up my anvil is when I did the video and looked at it, but <laughs> creating that neck. The shape that we are creating is this double-sided taper, uh, which is the start of the hook and isolates our blob of material for the um, end that is gonna end up becoming the flower. The next step is we go for a squish. And I'm trying to do this on the diagonal, but you can see how it's not really on the diagonal, but it's still getting the mass of material flattened out into a thick, I always call it a lozenge a little bit. Um, generally down to about, a, about half the thickness of the starting stock material and then corners in ends up being very important, uh, getting everything squared up. And mostly we're just going for mass, uh, a somewhat uniform mass on the end of things. Our next step is we start doing some shapes and I use a, a motorcycle chain over my anvil um, and I use the hollow kind of ball punch to create the initial shape it's always best when using a tool like this to rotate it in case there's any inconsistencies in the ends of it. Then we go with a chisel and I like to divide into broad strokes, just four, and then separate those strokes again to make a relatively even eight spaces. Though some of my earlier flowers only did five or six. And I do the next ones subdividing those, I, I, it, it helps me to keep things even. Um, my, my lozenge at this point is a little, eh, more than an eighth, less than a quarter. So that's probably three sixteenths, but I think my brain only works in about in eighths. Um, next one. And this is what we end up with. The chisel cut went a little bit over into the center. That's not a big deal. It'll get fixed towards the end of it. Um, but that is where we are. And again, the thickness of this is about 3 sixteenths, and the corners that I made are helpful, uh, that I made on the edge of the anvil are helpful in terms of figuring out where uh, the chisel lines go. So my next step 
uh, is using a long punch. The tip of it is round. It's about a quarter of an inch, maybe a little bit more. Um, and it's a very long punch. It's probably 12, 14 inches long. And I find that very useful for directing these punches as I do this. Going around, working through the heat, um, and just continuing around. This initial start is just to get um, the location of everything, get them, getting them kind of centered in those chisel cuts. The next one is going a little bit deeper. Back, here we go. Doing heat, it, it cools down relatively quickly, but the long punch is very helpful towards steering these depressions out towards the outer edges of the, and you can see where they are kind of breaking the edge of the material through the chisel cuts to kind of create the petals of the flower. Again, cooling very quickly. Um, you can see how I'm angling my chisel, my uh, my punch to get to, to push those edges out past the outside of it. And once I have that, um, I skipped over a step where I moved to the larger punch, which is roughly three eighths, and just expand those a little bit. I couldn't really get good footage of that, but at that point, what you do is you take it, take it to the stump, you get your ball peen hammer. Next to twisting, this is one of my favorite things to do. <laughs> is to drive the metal into wood uh, and give it a little bit more life, give the petals a little bit more shape. And you can see on the back side of this how those chisel cuts act as separators for the various petals that are in there. I will probably go back and um, redo the center. And this is what I end up with after coming off of the stump. Uh, I have gone in, you can see the chisel cut is still there a little in the center of it, but I will go back in and redo this centerpiece again, just to define the inside edges of these petals. Um, but this is largely the way the flower comes out. My next step is to use that long punch and create a little depression for where it's going to be hung or where the screw is gonna go. Again, it's because this is so thin, um, so narrow a space, the long punch makes it much easier to uh, direct the depression to where I want it to go. And this is just fast forward motion, time lapse, doing my hook bending section, putting it all around like that. Gas forge. And some wire brush. And then we are done. And then we end up with one go. And there is the hook that we do. I'll usually drill a hole in, uh, in this in order to make a little depression for a screw. I think my next one of these I'm going to do, and this only came to me when I was making this one, uh, was to put my screw hole down a little bit farther and make the stem of the flower a little bit longer so that it's way up above the hook. I think that would be fun. And then these are these are my, where my dog's leashes are all put up. And you can see these are the leaf type, the same technique, um, pushing out the outside edges, uh, generating a small hook. And one of my friends who owns a... Um, uh, dog rescue made the suggestion on seeing the flower hook and like I said I've done more of these than I think I've done the flowers and this is my wife's trivet collection um, that is all up on the wall all the same types of hooks that's the most consistent portion of it this is and this is a much earlier flower that I did a long time ago uh, with the special hook for the turtle um, trivet that we have there you can see how it's it's not as defined as the one I, uh, the ones I'm doing now uh, this is a complicated one that the flower is pretty straightforward, but the hook was a double hooked um, to hold that particular trivet. And that and this storyboard are basically how I make this very straightforward project that I end up, and every time I, I get my wife a new trivet as a gift, I end up having to uh, make myself a new hook and figure out a new version of it. Well, thank you for this fantastic presentation. And I have to agree with Becky. Yes, they are really, really cute, especially the dog ones. Probably I also have to make a couple of these. Let's see how well it goes. Maybe we can try if people just ask their questions straight. How long is that blob? It's essentially a cube. It's basically a cube of material at the end of it. I've done some that are a little bit bigger um, for 
different projects, but it always ends up being a cube of material at the end. I find that's the easiest thing to keep somewhat symmetrical in terms of creating either the, the claw hook or the, the flower hook itself. Um, Michael, when you're doing that transition from the blob to, from the square blob, cubic blob, mm -hmm. to the flat blob, yes. am I seeing this right that you're sort of taking advantage of that um, tendency of things to rom and you're sort of intentionally roming it over so that you end up functionally, because you're kind of twisting it too at the same time, aren't you? To get it aligned with one of the flat sides. Am I reading not, that right? It's not intentional. Um, looking at that one that I did, I did that a little poorly. What I'm trying to do is do it on the diagonal um, mm -hmm. so that I'm getting the most amount of width possible is that I'll do it on directly straight down onto the diagonal. And then I have two sharp corners on the sides that I push in that I push inwards to make, to give me that mass so that I have a, a thick edge that I can push those petals, uh, those flower petals out with. Um, that video, I didn't realize until I was putting it together and editing it is, I did go kind of parallelogram on that, but it doesn't seem to adversely affect the project. I mean, the I material it, is there. I think it works. I think it's actually kind of clever. Huh. I'm going to have to try that for my next one then and see if I'm, if I'm just, Lord knows I'm good at parallelogramming things. The the hook portion of it is very, the very basic that that we've all done squared around, tapered to the length you want to do, a little curl on the end of it. Um, uh, I didn't use something that I learned from Caitlin uh, back when we did Roaring Camp was the uh, diagonal cross peen hammer, which I find to be tremendously effective for. Um, drawing out stems of things and flowers of things. I think it was a uh, blacksmith depot, I believe is where I got it from. Um, and I've been using that for a whole bunch of different hooks, but I wasn't going to try that on a, a project that I was trying to present. I was doing this the way I've always done it for the longest amount of time. Um, I've been doing these hooks since 2005, 2006, I think. Uh, and there are some fun adaptions for some of the the otter shaped trivets. There's one that just has these little ball feet. I had to make just a little, a little stub and file a round space in the top of it so that the little ball foot on this little pierced um, tin trivet would hang on the wall properly. Sometimes they're easy and it's, it's just, you know, a regular hook will work, but there's all sorts of weird ones up there. Any other questions by now? Um, well, I missed the first bit where you gathered up your material. I guess you must have jumped it up a little bit. But when you define the uh, extra material on the end, did you just do that with your hammer over the edge of the anvil? Or did you use a set of fullers in a fly press or something to uh, define that, um, that mass of material and then draw the stem away? Just hammer on the edge of the anvil, um, half place, half base blows on and off, um, doing that two-sided taper so that you're creating, um, you're creating, yeah, I, uh, the neck that that it starts with. But lay it on, lay it over the edge of the anvil, half base blows, ninety degrees, half base blows, and then get it flat back onto the anvil again, uh, which is a Brian Brazil technique that I incorporated a long time ago. Thank you. Okay, so I think now it's you, Caitlin. Hey, nice to see you, Michael. You um, too. Uh, thank you. Uh, I saw, I love the variation. That's so fantastic. Uh, what did you use for the actual pad of the paw? Was that multiple uh, marks or did you have a special tool for that? Um. Uh, there's a special tool that I've been meaning to make for a long time. Um, I've noticed when I look at the paw, paw prints of my dogs um, that it's a vaguely triangular shape. So I used, I would do a big ball punch, which is probably three quarter or seven eighths for the center. And then again, leaning it backwards and pushing forward to try to create sort of a three cornered sort of thing. Mm -hmm. 
pooch paws do kind of have a little <laughs> triangular sort of quality to them. Um, this is Taco. Taco is going to be 16. Um, and I keep meaning to make a, a big punch that's three, that has kind of that triangular lobe sort of shape, but I have not had much success in trying to forge something like that that leaves a decent impression. So I don't know if I could do a single punch like that, but I tend to do it with one bigger one and then aiming those directions. And in that case, even more so than the flower, having a lot of mass in the lower portion, you know, the paws are on the top, that can be a little bit thinner, but the lower portion, I need a lot more um, thickness in that in order to make that impression look like and not look just round, um, but triangular is what I'm shooting for. You can kind of see on this one where I've attempted to kind of lean in that direction. There's the other one there. Yeah, you can't really see it that, that well. Fantastic. But those are fun. And yeah, for your triangular and, punch, Michael, for your triangular punch, if you get can get hold of an old large triangular file, you could sink oh. that into a, sink that into a bit of steel, and that will give you a swage you could forge a bit of mild steel into. Oh. Or you could use the triangular file if you ground it up on the end and forged it out and just annealed it. Oh. That's a great idea. I like that idea. You make wonderful punches. I've used um, uh, flea market sharpening steels, those kind of, they have straight lines down them. It's usually a long piece of tool steel with a, with a fancy bone handle on the end of it. I've been using those for punches for years, for through punches. Um, so a file would be perfect. I had never even thought of that. that. Thank you. Yeah, you just got to be careful that you fully nail them. Yeah. I've never. Mm -hmm. Well, that's how my whole blacksmithing thing started was annealing files. I was like making lathe tools for a treadle lathe and I was trying to make a scraper out of a file and I didn't take the teeth off of it. I dropped three files into a barbecue chimney, put it with charcoal, lit it. Five minutes later, I had bright red steel. I was like, is that all it takes to get metal <laughs> red? Oh my goodness, this is easy. And I started building a brake drum forge that weekend. This is back in... 04, 03, 04, something like that. And I do this, this is all in, uh, I have a little backyard space that I set up next to my woodworking shop. It's about eight by 16. Uh, I built it during the pandemic. I had been on a patio, but the roof leaked on the patio. So I had buckets and then I had so many buckets that I had hoses to siphon the water, the rainwater out of the buckets. Um, because they were getting too heavy because so much rain was coming through. And I finally just gave up and, and built another space that's a little bit more watertight. Uh, but this is all in suburban backyard. I tend to do this in the middle of the day during uh, in like midweek, back in, in the before times before everybody was home all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and you can burn coal in the backyard if everybody else is at work. You just you know have to be a little wary of the fire department, uh, especially during fire season, uh, thankfully yeah. in California. We haven't had much of that this year. Further questions about the presentation of today? Just asking. <laughs> I don't have a, that much a question, but a suggestion. Of course, well, maybe. Go ahead. Because uh, I played a bit with copper and making color in steel. So if you take the flower like petals and clean it off, and then just heat it to a yellow to or high temperatures. You can melt copper wire onto it, and it will flow out. And then you like lightly brush it afterwards when it cooled off. It will make like a copper red sheen to it. That would be pretty cool to make some. Maybe have a bit of color or yeah. That is, that's a great idea. I've done a few of them with brass brush on them, but I've never tried it with copper. I only just worked with copper like two weeks ago. I showed earlier, um, my friend Celeste Flores uh, does a class in, uh, among other things, copper feathers. Uh, and it's a great beginning teaching material because it's somewhat forgiving um, of heat. But now that I've got some 
some little bit of practice with copper. I, I'll give that a shot, Espen. That's a great idea. That, that would certainly add some more um, visual interest to them as, as opposed to usual yellow that comes from brass, from brass brushing it hot. Mm. I have a question for everybody, I think. So brass brushing, hot brass brush on hot steel, lovely goldy color, <sighs> but does it last? Because I see folks who do this either putting no further finish on or putting a wax or oil finish on, which is, you know, air permeable and it doesn't keep stuff from tarnishing and it's fine brass particles. And everything I've seen that had this within a year was brown. Mm. It's, it's one of those flashy things when you're selling it off the anvil, but no longevity that I've seen. Is anybody other than spraying plastic over it, come up with a longevity thing on that? Am no, I crazy? I don't, think, I don't think there is one. You've, either, you've got to seal it, haven't you, from the atmosphere. I guess that's the only way you'll stop it tarnishing. We'll keep brushing it every so often with your brass <laughs> brush. <laughs> yeah, give, give, you know, when you sell it, give it with one of these brushes which go into the <laughs> drill. Yeah. Then one can apply it cold. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Works very well. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Okay, thank you. Um, so if someone wanted to use a hook like that in a humid area like a bathroom, um, what kind of finish would you put on the hook? I have had great success with um, UV polyurethane as a spray. Um, is I, that that I find, spar urethane stuff or is that different? Yeah, spar urethane, yeah. If you spar can find okay. it in, uh, uh, in a spray can version, I found that to be very effective um, in damp environments. Um, not, it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. I get a couple of years off of um, materials that are finished with that outdoors. Um, it does yellow a little bit, uh, I think, as it absorbs the UV, but that, you know, that could solve the brass brush problem, the durability of brass particles uh, version of it. But I've how had many, good luck with spray urethane. How many times would you spray over it to, for a complete coat? Um, I try not to do it hot with that material because that does not, um, it doesn't work at all when it's hot. Uh, when the when the metal is hot, but two or three coats, certainly no more than that, in in order to have it ready to be in a a damp environment or an outdoor environment. Even um, I found that to be very effective. Uh, there's a lot of other things. Beth was saying she uses penetrol, which is not material I'm familiar with. Is that like a it's, a, it's sold as a paint conditioner to help paint flow better. And it's sold in, you know, I, I get it in quartz, steel cans, one quart. Um, and yes, I have purchased it in California where the rules about any useful liquid at all are very stringent. Um, and it's, it's clear, you just wipe it on and, uh, it dries within a few hours and it's just clear. Um, it's a little shiny, but it's not very thick. Um, and I have no idea what it is or isn't doing, but I, it, I've had good results. The only thing I've heard that doesn't work with Penetrol is that you don't want to put it on fireplace screens because they it will get tacky when it gets hot. Relax, really? Uh, well, I, I just read this to everyone. We have had good luck with breast brushing and ran wax or paraffin as long as whatever it doesn't stand outside. We did some sunflowers in March of 2022 that have kept their brass color. Huh. I'm impressed. So maybe back to this question of, I think, Bridget, was it? Um, I have been using for stuff which is in our bathroom burnishing tar into it like uh, getting it up to around 300 degrees dumping it in tar 
and then hope that everything dries off from there or dry it over open flame on the forge or since i now don't have an open for like open fire forge anymore i just put it to an oven and uh, like an electric one and let like baking oven and kitchen from kitchen and let it sit there until it's dry and this seems to be like lasting forever it's now in our bathroom this s hook for well i would say for about five six years and it still looks like i had put it there it's not immediately underwater though but it's hanging somewhere and holding my uh, sauna hat sauna condition Serious? Yeah, no, no, no. It it it's in the shower side of the sauna. Sauna. But oh wow! It hangs the hat which I use for when I go for, you know, cold bathing and so on. <laughs> and you're using a, a pine tar or a birch tar or some other wood tar, right? Not asphalt tar. Well, I suppose it's birch, but it is here sold just as tar for boats and. Yeah, I have so, not read from which kind of plant it comes, but I suppose it's it's birch here. It's it's, it's not yeah. from plants that died three hundred million years ago. No, 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 I I doubt. Yeah. Uh, do you find you get any um any uh transfer of the finish off of something that's been tarred? Uh, no like white towel. Well, no, because that's why it has to be dried afterwards, like either over the open flame mm -hmm. or in the oven. And then it it's it's like, uh, what is it? Lakka, varnish? Mm. Like this stuff you spray on, for example? Mm -hmm. It's totally the same. It doesn't go anywhere. Okay. Only if you don't dry it fully. So it might be not suitable for bigger pieces, which don't fit into some kind of heating source. I have to try that tar, especially for some of the exterior stuff. I've got a bunch of exterior sculptures that I'm all that I'm that the polyurethane works on, but um, I like the idea of using something a little a little bit more durable like that, especially since everything gets black. Yeah, it gets very black afterwards. Mm -hmm. I think they have been originally uh, in school. We were introduced introduced to it when we made boat hooks like this for floating devices. These hooks and they were treated in that way traditionally no so i don't know that i'd get birch tar in the uk i've never seen it anywhere hmm. in in the us we get pine tar and it's usually sold at the farrier supply because it's used on hoofs oh, okay now I'd, I'd never seen this method of finish it's sort of a variation on a uh, hot oil yeah finish. yeah and I never yep. saw it until I was in, in Denmark and where that's all anybody used. Huh. They use tar, they, so tar is like the standard. Yeah. Huh. Well, yeah. here, no. It's, and if you go to, the, if you go to the, the feed store or something, you can get a nice big can of it at a very decent price. Yeah, here it's sold like in, um, like, what is it? Something like Walmart or some or, or smaller. You can basically get it everywhere. Mm -mm. But you have to be careful. Uh, the smoke is poisonous. Just Ooh. saying, you know, I usually do it outside. <laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah, don't breathe it. I've also heard of people mixing it with uh, oil to make it a bit thinner. So, because yeah. tar is very thick, well, so to be able to just brush it on stuff instead of dipping it, they mix it with oil and to thin it out. With like a, a linseed oil? Yeah. Flax oil? Yeah. You can buy it on Amazon. I've just looked it up. <laughs> Pine tar hoof care formula for horses comes from the US. <laughs> it's also seems... a health product. Yeah. It Unfortunately, like you UK is still out of EU. Otherwise, one could just send you a pair, like some liter. Yeah, interesting. 
we actually sometimes sell here in the U.S. something called coal tar, which is a as as a as a skin conditioner in some cases um, that I haven't seen in a few years, but I remember being prescribed it at one point. And coal, yeah. really coal tar. All right, this feels very. It's very very nineteenth uh, century. And it smells like it came out of an oil well. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. You could get cold cold tar soap in the UK years ago. Yeah. Are there any further questions? Michael, have you taught this very often? Uh, I demonstrated this at a uh, roaring camp in 2021, I think it was. It was oh. the first roaring camp that we had um, did after the pandemic. Um, and it was fun. It was very... Very straightforward. Uh, Victoria took up the paw hook uh, version of it and did a couple of those for her niece who had uh, so graciously agreed to haul all of our anvils down to there. Um, finding, moving the equipment to educational areas is, is probably the biggest logistical thing that we have to do. Uh, but I've taught at that one, um, at Roaring Camp, uh, I've shown other people how to do this. I've had friends come over and like, oh, I'd like to try some foraging. Okay, cool, let's make a little flower. Um, I think I did a version of this uh, for the Society of Inclusive Blacksmithing, the mentorship program when I was doing a, a mentorship about a year, about a year ago, a little over a year ago. Uh, and we did that as one of our beginning projects as well, both making the tools, um, the round punches out of center punches, flea market, rifts things like that um and then doing the flower as a as a design element that you can drop into other things that you can put on to you know i think we did a we did a hook uh, a round rack that had a flower on either end of it and the hooks were all flowers around as oh, one of those okay. examples it, it's okay. it's it's fun to have something that you can to, in your tool bag that you can just go to to decorate something a little bit more so I'm curious what you've found, what parts of it tend to go well and where the hang the 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 hangups tend to be the most, just where where you need to kind of focus with folks more and where it's like, yeah, that just went. Um initially I made them much smaller. Uh I would only do like five lobes on it, five petals on it, uh sometimes six petals on it. Um and I found that uh, those tend to look a little, they look a little lumpy. Um, the, the other issues I run into, um, the transition to the stem. Um, I used to try to do a stem from underneath to, to drop out of the middle of it um, and keep it like do a, have a petal, a petal on one side and a petal on the other side and the stem coming down from the middle, um, which is kind of how this ended up like this one. Uh, and sometimes that gets a little weak down there. The the section down in the bottom section, if you've done a chisel cut, and then you've got a place for a cold shut. And sometimes it will mess around a little bit, in which case you have a very pretty rivet head um, as it snaps off. Uh, and making the material, um, the initial octagonal blob too thin, this blob right here if that ends up being too thin then you tend to break through um so you can see here it's about like i said more than an eighth less than a quarter uh that tends to uh you have to have enough material there push those petals out past the perimeter of the edge of it but yeah just running out of running out of material I, I think is the is the biggest issue that I've run into. I think I've tried to do these in three eighths, and it's even more pronounced. You don't have enough underneath your round punch to push things out. You just feel yourself hitting the hitting the edge of the anvil, and there's no there's nowhere else for the material to go. That makes sense. I mean, that does make for some nice rivet heads, though. You drill a hole right through the middle of it. And, it was like, oh, look how fancy that is. Like, yeah, that's a mistake. <laughs> that was an error. But all craftsmen do that. We all, 
oh, wow, that's beautiful. Well, here, let me show you where I messed up right here. Oh, wow, I never would have. <laughs> All craftsmen, woodworkers, ceramicists, metal workers. I don't know if painters do it so much. We need to have other people selling our stuff for us. Or just know when to shut up. Yes. <laughs> know when to shut up. <laughs> I, have, I have a coworker who has gotten into woodworking over the course of the last year. And that I think that was like the third thing I tried to tell him what to do. Just don't don't point out what, what's wrong with it. Bask in the praise, as uncomfortable as that is. Couple of couple of words. Thank you, Michael, again for giving this presentation. Thanks everyone for the great questions. The next treff will be in the 12th of February, hold by Caitlin. And uh, she will talk about the body mechanics of blacksmithing. Very much looking forward to that. And uh, yeah, if you're interested in giving a TREF presentation, feel free to contact me or the address on the website or Paul Foss. Uh, just contact us and we will uh, arrange that you can give your TREF presentation. It's all voluntary work, so we are very, very uh, interested in he seeing anyone who has something to share. Uh, it's always fantastic. And um, what I have been hearing from people who ha ha give this TREF presentations is they also get something back and that they learn it better what they are teaching by teaching these things. <laughs>